Hi, everybody. My name is Ellen Ovelia. And I'm Robin Ho. And welcome to another episode of Taking Care. To begin today, we would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which today's discussion will be held, the Wurundjeri people and the Boon Wurrung. We pay our respects to all elders past, present and emerging of the Kulin nations. We acknowledge that sovereignty has never been ceded, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. In this episode of Taking Care, we'll be talking to Marina Benini, a Yorta Yorta and Wurrung artist based in Melbourne. Marina is an artist whose works are informed by experiences as an Aboriginal and Italian woman. Within her practice, she creates artwork that examines contemporary Indigenous histories through the use of installation and video. Marina has recently exhibited at the inaugural exhibition for bus projects at their new space in Collingwood Yards, with her exhibition A Tribute to the Concrete Box for Auntie Hillis. This new body of work repositions narratives around Indigenous people and their position in institutional structures. Influenced by Marina's great aunt, renowned activist, educator and writer Hillis Maris and her metaphor, The Concrete Box, Marina's work responds directly to the gallery space. She invites Indigenous visitors to use traditional tools, charcoal and a stone axe to mark and physically break through the white cube in the middle of the space behind which we can view a video work projected onto a bed of red sand, showing the artist inscribing on the window sashes of the room. For many contemporary artworks, the notion of art as a singular fixed material object has become highly problematic. These contemporary artistic practices are no- not only challenge how such art firms are collected and viewed, but they also challenge the underlying concepts and values of fine art conservation. Conservation of installation art challenges conservators to deal with viewer interaction, complex technologies, ephemeral materials, site specificity, and other issues concerning care and management of installation artworks. So in today's episode of Taking Care, we'll explore with Marina how we as conservators might conserve installation artworks uh, by discussing her recent exhibition, A Tribute to the Concrete Box for Auntie Hillis. Please welcome to the show, Marina Benini. Hello. (laughs) Hi, how's it going? Good, thank you. Good, thank you. That was a very warm welcome. Thank you. Oh, well, we we try. (laughs) We also very much enjoyed your exhibition uh, at Buzz when we were out, uh, let outside (laughs) in those days. (laughs) Yeah. So thank you. It was like a very long time ago, but yeah. It does. So to begin today's show, we just would like to focus on one particular work in the exhibition. Um, and it's the stone axe. Um, in a statement on the gallery wall, you invite Indigenous people to use the stone axe to break through the walls of the white cube that's located in the middle of the gallery space. Um, and we saw on opening night that as soon as the first break through the wall was made, it dramatically opened up the discussion and interaction within the space. It just kind of buzzed as soon as that happened. Mm-hmm. So I guess in that spirit, we just wanted to start with the stone axe and as a great place to kind of open up this discussion today. So just wanted to ask you um, just to tell us a bit about the stone axe. Um, what is it made of? How was it made? Um, just a bit about that object. Of course. Uh, before I start, I would also like to extend on what you said before. I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which I work and live, being the Wurundjeri and the Bunurong people, and I would like to extend my respect um, to all elders past, present and emerging. So thank you again for having me, and um, I'm really excited to unpack a lot of the materiality and the objects within my current show at Bus Projects. And yeah, a very good place to start would be the the stone tool. And um, I guess to start, it would be good to um, acknowledge the the work and research and the people that helped me to get to that finished product, which uh, a few people saw during the opening night. And um, so firstly, I um, was interested in recreating a southeastern Victorian stone tool that would be used within the show to deconstruct this white box. And I wanted this tool to be something that is representative of our history and our knowledge 
has Aboriginal people. And for me, um, what better object than a stone tool, which is holds a lot of knowledge and history to in itself, um, to its materiality, but also to the way that um, traditionally it was treated and handled. And um, so I started my research by doing a lot of um, reading on the tools and the materials that uh, Southeastern mob used. And I do acknowledge that stone tools are widely used across the entirety of Australia, but I was very interested in the Southeastern Victorian stone tools. Um, further on from my reading, I contacted Kimberly Moulton, who is a senior curator at the Melbourne Museum of the Southeastern Indigenous Collection, and um, I asked to be able to spend some time with those stone tools that they have there. And so on two separate occasions, I um, went into the Melbourne Museum and um, Kimberly Moulton was very gracious with her time. She spent with me as I um, perused the Indigenous collection there and um, seeing the different variety of um, the stone tools because there are different kinds. The one that I have in my show is an axe head and um, on top of an axe head there are other kinds like tomahawks and hammerheads and things like that which do um, exist in the Melbourne Museum collection and so being able to see the different kinds and hear the stories and also um, see the different materials that were used and um, the ways that the stones were ground down really influence the way that I made my stone tool. Um, so having had those two visits to the Melbourne Museum, I then went off to my studio <laughs> and spent some time um, thinking about the best way to go about trying to recreate this cultural object. And um, for me, uh, a good starting point was to source these objects and these, sorry, source the materials that my ancestor had, ancestors had used originally. And so the stone tool that I have in my show is made from a, a stone called greenstone, which is very specific to the Victorian region. Uh, the stone itself was collected from the Mount William um, stone uh, quarry, which is uh, in, located in regional Victoria. That is now a culturally um, heritage site and can't be accessed by um, anyone quite easily. It's... Um, yeah, managed by the Wurundjeri Land Council at the moment, I believe. And so using that stone, I was then able to um, uh, shave it down into it, what it is formed at the moment. And that took a little bit of time because um, I was learning my... So what I enjoyed about this process was I was learning a lot. I was learning how to work with these materials and how to shape them in a very similar pattern and shape that my ancestors had done. So I was learning to grind this stone down and um, being able to see the way uh, and how the stone itself works and shapes over time was really interesting. And um, similarly to the stone tools that I was able to visit in the Melbourne Museum, I went out to source uh, wood. And the wood that I used was um, a gum, like eucalyptus uh, wood, um, what I do understand, though, from my research is that the wood varied in different kinds and types, and um, they also incorporated bark as some of the handles at some point. And a lot of the way that they used to um, uh, mould and shape the wood so it would kind of encase the stone would be to either put it into water so the wood would expand or to put it over the coals of a fire where the wood would also expand, which would make it a little bit more malleable to be able to shape, be shaped around that stone. So um, I decided to work with the eucalyptus um, branch because it was something, well, eucalyptus plays quite a dominant part within my own practice and I still wanted to incorporate that and acknowledge that. And I wanted to also test myself to see how I could work with this particular wood. Um, so I used that. And then I also incorporated an ochre resin, which was playing on from the fact that traditionally uh, resin was actually quite used often. And the way that they um, 
the old mob used to make their resin was they used to extract particular parts from different native plants that would they then mold into a kind of paste that they would then um, put around the stone that would stick it of sorts onto the wooden handle. So that would kind of be their resin. And um, so I wanted to uh, play that, um, play to that, but also pay pay tribute to the way that mm. they very um, incredibly, I think, were able to use the different materials available to them. So I had an ochre resin on my stone tool, and then um, what I I really loved seeing while I was in the Melbourne Museum collection was the ways that um, the stone tools or the hatchets or the hammerheads were. I don't, I don't want to say the word decorated, but they were inscribed in some sorts. And that inscription would either be through mark making on the surface of the handle, or it could be through like, um, weaving, which was either done at the base of the hatchet or across the top of the stone. And so, um, using a natural twine, I wove across the handle of my stone tool, which would kind of, act and do two things, which would be um, a mark making, but also would enable the wood to be um, sustained in a stronger grip that would then house the stone um, in a more stronger, or have more stronger stability just because having full um, a full awareness that this, the stone tool I was making was going to be used quite a lot and um, in quite a physical <laughs> way that would see... <laughs> Um, uh, a lot of acting from it. So, yeah, that's kind of like a, a, a quite good overview, I would say, of how my thinking came to the stone tool and, and my thinkings through the materials. Yeah. yeah. And, I mean, you've touched on a lot of this already, but in terms of the significance of the materials, like the how important were those materials that you ended up using to that object and the meaning of the work as a whole? Mm, yeah, for sure. So I think um, when I was thinking about trying to recreate, um, and I do use the word recreate because um, obviously stone tools aren't used in a normal daily basis. They aren't what you see builders using to make houses and things like that. And so when I use the word recreate, I am acknowledging that these are tools that were made a long time ago by my ancestors and by other um, local traditional owners and mobs. And for me, it was really important to pay homage to the work and the knowledge that those um, people held and were able to pass down through the making of these tools. And um, also acknowledging that these stone tools originally were very important to the local mob here because they were very um, specific to this area. So they were representative of the local mobs here. And they were also used traditionally, um, they used, they used to be, um, traded, actually, the stone mm -hmm. tools. And that's why, uh, you will find some Victorian stone tools in different collections across Australia because they have traveled. And that was because of the trade system that happened here. And, um, these stone tools, like, uh, they were very proud of them. Like, they showed their, the way that they worked and showed how hard they worked. And, um, and they were used. And so um, making sure I was able to acknowledge all of that, it was important for me to use the same materials or to attempt to use the same materials and practice that those tools were tools were originally made with because um, it was important to me to also learn those steps and how to make those kind of things. Yeah. yeah. And I guess you've, you've kind of touched upon our next question really, <laughs> but... Um, we were going on about um, the next question was about the greenstone tools being used by local um, Victorian Aboriginal communities, um, and you've touched on the I guess how they're traditionally used and their ongoing significance. But um, I guess wanted to maybe talk about uh, how important it was for you to actually go through that process of crafting it because um, I guess you're you're re embodying it. You're re um, embodying history, I guess, and getting in mm. touch with your, um, with that kind of culture, uh, with that, your lineage. So, um, and how does that, how was that process for you making the stone axe? And um, I guess doing all this research and finding out more about um, these materials. Mm. 
Yeah. So I would say that through this process of making and collecting um, that saw the course of me getting to the stone tool, I would say that I um, really developed like a conversational practice in the sense that a lot of the time I would, um, it's not knowledge that I have learnt myself. It's knowledge that exists through my family members, through my uncles, my aunties, my elders. It's knowledge that exists in uh, places like the Melbourne Museum that have those, that information written down either through community members and consultation that has been done with the local mobs. And it is through just being able to yarn with people about those uh, those things and those stories and those materials that I was able to um, create an image of my head about how I wanted to wanted the tool to be shaped, but also how I wanted it to be viewed and um, by the viewers themselves. Because the tool itself represents so much um, and I could write essays and essays and essays about <laughs> all of that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it was important for myself to, but also as I'm thinking about this now, having those yarns with like local community members, with my family, with like the institutions, traditionally that's how a lot of the cultural items that we now view in institutions. That's how those items are made. Like that's how as Aboriginal people we pass down our knowledge is through yarning and it's through oral transition. And I was able to I inherently do that all the time with my my work. <laughs> but I really did notice it while making this tool that I was yarning heaps and just being like practicing deep listening a lot as well. Mm. Yeah, that's really important. <laughs> So um, this exhibition is titled A Tribute to the Concrete Box for Auntie Hillis and is influenced by your great aunt Mar uh, Hillis Morris and her short story The Concrete Box. Um, can you tell us who Hillis Morris was and the significance of The Concrete Box in the exhibition? Yeah, of course. Uh, so Auntie Hillis, um, to position uh, myself to her so people can understand is my grandmother's sister so my great aunt and um, I have a very in my family very strong mat matrilineal lineage and mm -hmm. a lot and I have a lot of matriarchs and in their own right they are all strong deadly incredible women that hold themselves in um in such ways that I only look up to and one of those ways Oh, sorry, one of those women that I, I continue to look up to is my Annie Hillers. And she's a renowned activist, writer, artist and educator. She was an instigator in, in creating and starting Victoria's first Aboriginal high school, which still exists in Hillsville, which is now called, it is always called Warrawa College. But she was a very strong instigator in that and education was also always important for her. She was very um, strong in her teachings in trying to get local mob and, and family to always um, understand how important it was to go to school and to be educated, to um, play the white man's game as of sorts. <laughs> um, and one of the things that through her activism she was able to do quite well was her writing and uh, the concrete box is one of many different writing metaphors that she ha she wrote and for me it is one that has stayed with me for a long time I first read it about five years ago now and it is something that I continuously come back to because it's one thing that one thing that I do notice about the metaphor is that it's ageless every time I read it I learn something different and every time I read it, I realize that things still aren't shaping up to thinking. I um, thought it was time to bring it out <laughs> <laughs> and make it um, readily available to the public and community that may have not had the opportunity to, to read it of sorts. Yeah. And so it was really important for me um to obviously recognise her work and to pay tribute to the work that she has done and continues to do through um, her metaphors, her writing and her work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, yeah, it was great um, to go and read it uh, in the program as well and I think we'll hopefully 
find a link to it somewhere that we can um, <laughs> put up because it's it's a really really powerful powerful piece and mm. it's yeah kind of um, it was like that at on the opening night that it was um, making me angry that it was still relevant <laughs> yeah. like it was written like oh you know decades ago and it's kind of like surprising that it's still so um, relevant now mm. to the current mm-hmm. situation so it's a bit yeah depressing <laughs> but, <laughs> yes. yeah. but I think yes. as well you know having that um, physical box in your exhibition uh, was so powerful as well mm. as like a you know in extension of that metaphor and you know it was uh, really powerful to watch um, the participants at the at, at the opening oh, break it down. breaking it down yeah. and yeah. writing their marks on the walls <laughs> and and owning it yeah, yeah. It was so brilliant you know and deconstructing it which was just um, a great thing to yeah. see mm. and that's um, that actually kind of leads into um, our next question um, and that interaction as we mentioned. Um, and have just mentioned then the in the exhibition you specifically invite Indigenous visitors to the exhibition to use that stone axe as well as the charcoal um, to break through the walls of the white cube in the centre of the gallery space um, th- through which, you know, other viewers can see the video work housed within. Um, how important is that interaction and the breaking of the wall um, mm-hmm. with the axe to the meaning of you know, the, the show itself and, you know, as especially as that acts as an mm. object now being used in that way. Yeah. So uh, the interaction itself, I think uh, it does play a key part within the show. But what I was trying um, to make it aware was that I didn't want that um, interaction to be, to have too much pressure on it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I didn't want um, for Indigenous mob to encounter the work and feel obliged and I didn't mm-hmm. want them to feel like they had to perform for anyone because mm-hmm. that work was definitely not what that was for. Mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. wanted that interaction to be um, willing, willingly and self-determined and I, um, for me that interaction, um, the way that I look at it, I kind of am like I set, I set it up so that it, it enables itself, but I do not want, I do not control how it plays out. Uh, that's up to the viewer and up to the person to, to do that. And so for me, again, going back to the metaphor, thinking about this, this concrete box that Arnie Hillis had described and the first, the first reaction that I had to this very visual, like strong image of this concrete box was that I was angry. Like this mm-hmm. box that was this representative of all the structures, the institutions, the rules and the laws that continue to govern Indigenous people across Australia that houses and, and you know, instigates so much um, in like intergenerational trauma. And I was angry, obviously. Mm-hmm. And so the first thing I wanted to do personally was like to just completely <laughs> deconstruct, ruin this mm-hmm. box, like put holes in it. And um, I started thinking about uh, that feeling, that initial feeling about why I wanted to do that. And uh, it became obvious to me it was, um, it was an action of reclamation. It was an action mm-hmm. of reclaiming the power back Mm -hmm. and um if that could be done like um for me it would be a a potential answer to the the question that my aunt voices in her metaphor which is when will the time come for all careers to have their health freedom and like peace of mind Mm -hmm. and so yeah having um created this this like quite big immovable white structure in this gallery (laughs) space i remember once it was built I kind of had this thought to myself, I was like, oh my God, what have I done? <laughs> I was like, this big white box is so menacing, like, oh no. <laughs> and then um, and then when I saw that first um, breakage of the box mm. by um, Peter Waples Crow, he was the first person to grab that axe and then just hammer straight into the box. I think it was the moment that when he turned around to me and he said um that he felt liberated mm-hmm. and that he felt f- like that was a freeing action mm-hmm. those words I think that was the moment that I was like 
Yeah. This is this yeah. is it. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, yeah, and I think um, again, having put so the reason I had two different options, i.e., the stone tool or the charcoal, for people to interact with the box, was because I understand that the the action of physically breaking something it, it is a lot. I mean, it is a lot to mm. ask something like that from someone that may potentially feel. Um, that may be too much for them. And so mm-hmm. to, for them to be able to still be a participant if they wanted to, I offered this charcoal that I had collected mm-hmm. from um, a fire. And the charcoal itself sits on a branch that I collected from the National Barma Forest, which is up on Yorta Yorta country. And so it sits there quite um, uh, softly. And... Um, I don't encourage anything. I just use the word mark, which you said mm-hmm. before in, in the writing. And mm-hmm. I think um, what came from that was really special. The way that people mm-hmm. marked and wrote and um, left some essence on the box. Also in the show, um, I'm constantly still reflecting on it and I will continue to um, reflect on it for a long time because what people offered back to the work and back to myself was really something else. Mm-hmm. Mm. Definitely. And I, I guess we'll talk about um, where the box was located and um, and I guess showing the stone axe and the, the whole exhibition, I guess, in the white space of a, a gallery. At Especially, Fox. you know, when a gallery space, you're not meant to touch anything <laughs> yeah. traditionally. <laughs> Let alone bust a, a hole in a wall. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, so, yeah, how, I guess, um, was it important to kind of locate the works within the, this kind of um, white, pristine, kind of archetypal mm-hmm. gallery space? And I guess how does that work with the ideas of um, Aboriginal kind of uh, like self-determination that you're trying to kind of um, mm. like in, get into people's, like into the viewer? Mm. So how does that relate with the ideas of the work, I guess? Yeah, it was um, always the first thing that I acknowledge and kind of vowed to myself to do was in this project and this work was to acknowledge the history and the people that are located in that area in Melbourne because Mm -hmm. the history is very rich around that area on Smith Street, Brunswick Street, and it's evident in the Indigenous organisations that are located across that area. And, um, you know, I I say it in the short essay on the the page, but I grew up, like, being told stories from my mom and my uncles and my aunties about all the times that they'd spent there and the family they'd run into and all the different um, events and occasions that they'd been to. And it was just so important to um, address that within the work. And and for me, a question that I wanted to... um, that I was continuously thinking about while making the work was how could I put or bring that history into this white space, into this um, new Collingwood Yards, which was and is still under construction, but is essentially a big art institution that has taken up this space, yeah, in, in Collingwood. And and so for me, that was where the mark making on the windowsills, that work, um, it stemmed from these thoughts and these feelings because it is important for me, um, and I always do it with my own work, it's important for community to access my work and my work to be accessible by community. And for me, it's important, and it was important for the community to be in that space mm-hmm. because that space is like for them which is important mm-hmm. because inherently those spaces aren't Indigenous. Mm-hmm. And so I was really thinking about those kind of ideas. And so the mark making I did on the windowsill was a long-term um, intervention with the gallery and with Collingwood Yards because um, I, I told them first up like months, months ago, even before they'd started, like bus projects had started the construction on the building, I was like, I'm going to do some mark making and it's going to be there for a very long time, <laughs> if anything, forever. <laughs> and, <laughs> and 
and um, they were really supportive. Actually, they they wanted to see it happen, and they wanted they wanted that um, long term intervention to happen. And and for me, it's important that it's there because it is representative of the histories and the knowledges and the local community that are still there. Totally, um, and I mean that that kind of leads us into the um, uh, the conservation thoughts mm-hmm. of of this discussion and um you know it, it, speaking about um how much significance was attributed to i suppose that site as the, the the point for the work to be located in and as well you know the um the, the not the, so much the performative nature of it but there was a very strong interaction element to it that um you know between audience and the work itself would this be a work that you would um, exhibit in future in the same sort of way or is that something that you know it, you kind of feel like that was specific to that site and if you were to do something again it would have to be uh, you know more relevant to the to the, the new site or mm. would it, you just start again or <laughs> talk, us, talk us through that. Yeah yeah of course so um, the way that I practice is that I'm almost completely site specific actually Mm -hmm. with the way that I respond to the show that I am part of um and that site specific specificity is very important to the work because I put it upon myself to research and understand the history and location that my work will be like located and placed in because um I like to like I was saying before I'd like to position indigenous knowledge in the fore and that for me is responding directly to the site in which I am I am in because like I was saying before those sites are not indigenous and Mm -hmm. so it is um for myself to be even moving through those sites it is a political act and Mm -hmm. for me to be making the work that I do it is a political act and so I really do try to focus on like the action which is very evident um in the work that is at bus projects and so for me I probably would not recreate this show because it is so specific to the site um the ideas though those are ideas I continue to respond to and think about and it's something that I've actually um I'm delving further into as I'm undertaking research in masters this year so Mm -hmm. As I um, move through that space itself, um, I do imagine the work to take a different shape and form, but always being site specific. Yeah, wonderful. I mean, um, I guess as well, following on from that, if it was to be, um, you know, those same ideas of the concrete box and the the mark making and um, the axe and the charcoal, perhaps, if if that was to be reformulated in another way, w- like would it have to be specifically in a gallery space or is this something you could see, you know, going out into the world? <laughs> yeah, I think that's, um, it's an interesting question because um, <clears throat> I remember uh, quite a little bit ago now that um, I, I was thinking along those lines, actually, a lot of the projects and work that I was making, I was making so that it would be viewed from outside in in a more natural, um, earthy, country-focused setting. And um, it's something that I do continuously tend to think about now. Um, But the reason I haven't actually done it yet is because I don't think the art world is ready for that kind of work. (laughs) I I don't think... (laughs) Yeah, I think... The industry um, needs to break out from its galleries and needs to um, think literally outside of the box. So (laughs) I, in the future, I would tend to move towards thinking more so outside as my work um, does tend to centre country. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, watch this space. Yeah. (laughs) Um, so, um, so we've talked a bit about the Stone Axe um, today and how it interacts with all the other works in the exhibition and um, how it's interacted with by um, audience members. Um, how, I guess, would you use, I guess, the recordings and the documentation from BUS to kind of uh, inform how you 
um, recreate the show, I guess, mm-hmm. and um, re-show something like the stone acts and the charcoal and the box. Yeah, so um, the documentation is actually very important for this show because the work can't be undone and those mm-hmm. actions can't be undone. And so it was important um, before the opening that um, the the show was documented prior to the opening. It was documented at the opening. It has since been documented now and will probably be, depending on how we go, will probably be documented just before it closes. And the way that I um, am thinking about that documentation at the moment um the documentation will probably become the work because mm-hmm. at this stage I don't see myself recreating that exact show. And mm-hmm. I think it's interesting because in that documentation you will see the way that objects will have moved over over time, how they would have moulded over time and been interacted with over time. And it will be evident even when I get that stone tool axe back because it's already changed its shape from the way that it's been interacted with by the, the public and by local mob, I already know from leaving the opening that um, the the hilt of the axe itself has um, been changed because of the different way that people were holding it, the weavings have come undone. <laughs> and I think that's so, um, I think it's quite nice because it in that, like, in that it shows the way that people are interacting and it's, it holds that essence you know, mm-hmm, yeah. and it holds a touch. Mm-hmm. And even, um, you know, prior to people using the tool, the stone didn't have any plaster on it. But now that mm-hmm. the, the tip's coated in white plasterboard and we'll ha- probably have to take a little bit of sanding to get it off. So the work um, has changed and um, whether or not I I think I would like to continue working with the wa- sorry, the axe and um, whether that is uh, continuously trying to shape and weave and look at the materials differently um, because what I did find in making this particular work is that I am very interested in these, these cultural items and mm-hmm. it's something that I think what will become important in this conversation is that like these cultural items... Um, the significance that they have to to community so mm. yeah yeah I think that, that also what you said about you know the touch and the plaster and the how the weaving has changed is like so much a part of um, it being used as part of this exhibition so you know yeah it's obviously a question for you about moving forward if you retain those elements or if yeah. you know they're just now part of it um, and I yeah. suppose in terms of thinking about it you know, if if as a it's physical material elements, um, you know, for the conservation of it, the stone itself um, is a very durable durable material. Mm. Um, but you know, oftentimes in conservation, when uh, it, that plaster is now a part of it, and so you know, a traditional thought could be, oh well, you have to get it back to the clean stone. Uh, you know how yeah. it looked at the beginning, but now you know that plaster is a well, part has of a it. significance. I guess mm. it it mm. shows its history of use in this exhibition, and I guess you know not showing the exhibition again. That's part of your documentation is these kind of remnants of yeah. the plaster on mm. the stone yeah. and things like that. So yeah, and, and I just had sorry to cut you. Off, I just had a thought, like um, thinking about how this this tool that I had. Um, made it, is quite strongly influenced by the tools that I was able to see in the Melbourne Museum and fully knowing that I won't be able to do what I did with those tools in the Melbourne Museum ever. Like, no one will. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it comes back to, um, for me, when I think about collections that house those cultural items, um, to, you know, like it's so important for mob to be touching those items, to be with mm. those items, to spend time with those items. And, um, I we used to work at the Korea Heritage Trust. So I used to work in the collection there, actually. Mm-hmm. And I remember Uncle Jim Berg, who was, um, the uncle that kind of instigated the Korea Heritage Trust and got it to, uh, get on, get on its feet as, of sorts. And he said that, um, the most important thing for me to do is to get mob in here with these items 
because it is the touch from mob to those items that will give life into those items and it's vice versa as well so it's it's so wonderful Mm. and great that they those collections are there for um, people to go in and actually touch them Mm. next step is getting them out to you exactly (laughs) (laughs) Um, and I suppose more on the materiality of the the axe itself Um, obviously the stone is very durable but in thinking about that wood um, Mm. and the twine those I suppose as organic materials um, would be the elements that would be more vulnerable to chemical degradation from you know heat and light and moisture Mm -hmm. and the air Um, and so you know in future if those elements were degraded to a point where they were no longer functional. Um, you know, in terms of repairing or re- replacing them, would you um, would you want them to be replaced with the same material, or would it be more important for you to go and actually gather new materials, or mm. you know, in in the far 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 future? Um, yeah, you know, it would it be important who does that work? Yeah, you know, would it be um, somebody local? Um, hmm. Mm. I think for me, um, it would be important to firstly understand how um, traditionally cultural items like stone tools were um, recovered to see um, what kind of materials, if they did introduce new ones or if they did use the same ones. So I probably can't answer that completely now but that would give if that that would give me a starting point to figure out where to find those answers because kind of like I was saying earlier before I'm really um interested in and also really acknowledge the history that these items are representative of and mm. um and I want to practice and, and treat these items with the respect that they deserve. And so mm-hmm. to do, do that, it would be going to my elders and, you know, hearing these stories about how these items were treated, because I think mm-hmm. um, it's important to acknowledge that. And um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. You know, that's mm-hmm. wonderful. And yeah, I think mm-hmm. that's such an important um, point as well, that, you know, that all of this knowledge is around. You just have to... Um, you know, know where to look to, yeah. to get it rather yeah. than being like, oh. Yeah. So I guess in the best case scenario in the far, far future, when you someone has to conserve this object, your preference would obviously be to use a traditional method of repair and research that and kind of, I guess, have those discussions mm-hmm. and that two-way learning with community. For sure. How, yeah. Yeah. Great. Wonderful. Okay. I think we've um, covered most, most of it. <laughs> we've uh, yeah, gone some new places. Yes. But, um, um, and you actually talked about a lot of things unprompted for us, so we kind of had to skip a lot of, a lot oh, of questions. I know. I'm that's sorry. really I great. So no, that's no, that's, no, that's really that's good. That's what we wanted. That's what we wanted, so it's great. <laughs> so, so, yes. Yeah, thank you so much for talking with us today. No, thank you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Of course. And I think you've really highlighted, you know, how much um, sort of intangible elements there are around an object that seems so physical and material. And, you know, that is really the important thing to be thinking about in terms of, you know, if you're going to conserve this stone axe used by community, then, Mm. you know, engage with that community to... Yeah. <laughs> and it's yeah, and it's not just the I uh, guess the object. Like the object is a symbol of um, this event that happened, and that um, and these ideas and these actions and this history. And I guess um, uh, yeah, to look beyond I guess the material, just the material object. Mm-hmm. There's all these other layers going on. So mm-hmm. it's great to really delve into all of that. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah, thank you so much, and uh, we look forward to your master's year. Oh, yeah, yeah, me too. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> Are you doing that currently? Yeah, so I've started already. Um, so, yeah, that's a Master's of Fine Art at Monash University. Wonderful. So, yeah. Well, good luck with that. And, Thank uh, you. Thanks so much, Marina. Yeah.